start um, just because uh, we're short of time and you guys have been sitting here a long time. So just to kind of recap, um, my name is Kate Neal. I'm the director of a company called HKD. We design museums, exhibitions and heritage sites and we've done a bit of work with you guys here in the Singapore Science Centre. I'm also the founder of Geek Play. Um, it's an organisation set up to do stuff that can't necessarily happen within established organisations. We work with games and play. And actually we talk about meet, make and play. Um, the meet your friends, family, but also artists, producers, makers. Make because we're all creators, not consumers. Um, and play because the world's a better place to play together. And here at the Maker Fair, you really don't need to be told a load of that because you've already got that where sometimes in the big outside world that needs a bit more explanation. But here we're surrounded by friends. Um, so the title of this session is The Power of Daydreaming, Tinkering, Rolling Worms, Challenges for make, of Making for Educators. And in a way that last session just set it up perfectly. And that last question about you know, what, what's the difference between making in a makerspace and making in schools. And there was a real sense of liberation that came from making in the makerspaces. Um, now I'm delighted to have three people with me here who have all kind of looked at this edge between the making space and education and really the fact that we need to address what's happening in education. So with no more ado, I'm going to hand over to the first of the three speakers who are going to talk about their experience looking at this area. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Carol McGillivray. There you go, Carol. Thank you very much. Hello, um, Dr. Carol McGillivray. Um, I'm giving a talk tomorrow, uh, a, a sort of case study about bringing action learning to engineers. So today, I thought what I'd do is um, that's in, in my role as a maker and an artist. So today I thought what I'd do is I'd pull out and, and zoom out um, uh, to a, a sort of higher level uh, look at how um, academia fights using maker technology and the problems with it. And I'm slightly qualified to do this because I did spend some time as an academic and I also spent time in management in the university, so I know how to read a spreadsheet of the university and see what's going wrong and what's going right, and uh, was involved in creating strategies. So in part, I'm putting on the kind of naughty manager hat as well as my, um, my artist hat, although I am uh, now really a recovering academic, <laughs> and uh, moving on with uh, making art instead. So uh, this is um, some thoughts, and I really hope that you uh, can give me your thoughts back on this, um, about uh, why the maker technology, why the maker fair, why the make, just the idea of using the idea of making and treating art, science, technology together holistically um, doesn't really work yet in um, HE and why it's resistant to it. And then sort of to talk about why, how maybe we could start to break it down. So I'm going to talk specifically about HE, although I have experience with children and so on. Um, the first thing is um, the silo mentality in HE, which I'm sure exists here, but exists specifically in the UK in a, in a really serious way, through the managerial structure, through the budgets, and how they, they filter down through universities, and particularly through the research funding. We have, we have a thing called the <coughs> REF, which is the Research Exercise Framework, where for five years the budget for research within a university is fixed, and you get that budget from competing with your academics. This means that academics move around like football stars at the top from one university to another, and then sold and bought in this way. So it's a very odd um, system in, indeed. And a very expensive system, and it's a system that universities use up a lot of energy and a lot of money trying to make work. But the reason they do it is because their share of the whole money for the research in the UK comes from the, their percentage that they're judged to have made in that, in that particular time period. So uh, this, is, this creates a silo mentality. The silo mentality works at the management level as well because we're, we're um, split into departments. 
and we're split the science, art, business, whatever, they're always split up into different areas. And that comes from the research, but it also comes from the way the budgets are handed down through the university. Another thing that stops us treating it holistically is the culture of knowledge transfer. Particularly theorists like to, uh, like to go and um, put knowledge into students. There is a feeling that knowledge must be put into students rather than drawn from them. And uh, this, is, this is an issue when it comes to doing the maker um, idea. Um, so rather than looking at uh, creating student confidence and bonding and teamwork and all the things that we would value as employers when they come out of the university, we very often just try and stuff a whole load of facts into them. The staff fiefdoms in, the, in the, the UK, a lot of people fight their territory because of the money and the way it works and they want to hold on to it. And there's a student fear generally of moving outside of a particular area. They feel because of the way that this is structured that if they want to study one particular thing and if you move off piece in any direction they, they panic in, a, in quite a large way. Um, Yes. So uh, the, the other thing that happens is knowledge transfer versus facilitation, and the three big, the really three big things that stop this going on, and you you spend forever in meetings talking about these things, and they spiral into um, disuse or never happening. They sound like good ideas, but states don't want to do it, and the, it's a premium cost. The budget for materials and tools cost and health and safety really, you know, nobody wants to injure a student. And that is enough to stop really sort of interesting things going on. Real world problem solving, which is exactly something that uh, we do in uh, the maker technology. Um, well, the first problem here is that staff aren't really from the real world. Um, uh, most of them <laughs> are operating in their little silos and don't really, you know, they're frightened of the real world. That's why they're in academia. I mean, that's not true at all. But it is it's certainly, there is a, a flavour of that going on. Um, and a lot of staff um, are in teaching but haven't, haven't got the understanding of pedagogy that perhaps one might hope. So they don't try new things, they get stuck in a rut, they've always taught something one particular way, they keep on teaching the same way, they can't see a way of moving forward or changing the way things go. In the science area, there's a, a, in particular, there's a positive findings bias, um, and failure is never awarded. It's very hard to build it into an education system, and yet we all know that if you're going to go for real world problem solving, you're going to run down you know, some false rabbit holes before you get to the good things. And if you do get failures, there's no reward for it. There's no mark for the students, there's no budget funding. You know, the whole thing is um, not making you feel good. So, group work is the final one that I have, so I'm nearly there. <laughs> um, silo mentality in HE, which I uh, mentioned. There's also really severe silo mentality in students that is passed down through this. And students get very frightened about group work and you have to do a lot of work just to make students understand why group work is important. Outside, in the real world, we all hope that they can do group work and work with other people and that one of the skills they should be learning at university is how to go about that. It's very difficult for them to understand and appreciate that there's ways of marking that, and for, indeed for tutors as well, that there are ways of marking group work so that the, the proportion of work that they put in is reflected in their mark. And this is also to do with the weak emphasis on graduateness and soft measurables. When I was teaching, um, rather than teaching, specifically I was mostly teaching animation and business studies, and um, rather than teaching those, I was teaching critically reflective lifelong learning, really, um, which is not an easy one to measure. So this is uh, the final slide here. Um, solutions, and I'm really hoping you can all contribute to this uh, in one way or another. Um, the first thing 
if uh, any solution to happen, as we all know, is to admit it's a problem and create a desire for change. Um, personally, if I was in charge of the whole lot, which I'm not, uh, which is probably a damn good thing, um, I would remove all marketing departments and the spirit of competition between universities. I would get rid of the REF, I'd kill the HE cartel, which makes them all charge the same amount of money. I'd change the measurements of graduateness, which it is perfectly possible pedagogically to understand what you're doing. And understand the social effects of student drop-off and, and employment issues, which we get again and again, is that people come out as graduates and employees say, but they don't seem to understand how to work in a group, they don't seem to have confidence, they don't know how to do lots of things that they would expect, how to research independently. And you can do this through increasing modular learning, training staff in new models of facilitation. And the maker movement is a place that can really help here. We should be able to create uh, artist residences or engineer residences and be able to look across the disciplines and help the tutors to find ways through. Thank you. I can introduce myself because I have a slide specifically for that. Um, so some of you may remember me from a few hours ago when I tortured you with these things. Were there some people in the room still from there? Well, has everybody escaped after that? Um, so uh, I am a real world designer, uh, game designer. I used to work in the games industry and now I'm safely outside of that. But I also share uh, Carol's background of being a recovering uh, academic. Uh, we met for the first time on the plane, actually on the way over here, and spent, I think, two hours kind of going through our, our academic lives and how much fun it was, and how neither of us are now academics. So that probably tells you all you need to know. Um, so in my uh, life as a real-world designer, real-world game designer, um, I've made a number of things, uh, and what I'm going to do is talk about some of these and then touch on some of these areas, assuming I remember to, as we go through. Um, so uh, I was particularly amazed by the last session, actually, by, by, the, by the young people and the incredible stuff um, they've been able to make. You know, people uh, were talking about printing PCBs and playing with Intel Galileo, things, things that just weren't there when I was growing up. And I'm um, amazed and also very jealous by, uh, by the kind of things that are out there. Um, I often give examples of like growing up and how hard it was to be a maker um, 30 plus years ago, which gives you an idea of how old I was, and if I got stuck on a problem, I couldn't just go to a makerspace and talk to someone and get help. I mean, I, I, I literally did this, I wrote into a magazine, into a computer magazine, to ask for help, and the response took eight months. You know, so that gives you an idea of how different things were before the internet age. I'm very jealous, and it's incredible what people are doing. Um, so, uh, so Renga, some examples of the work that led up to Renga are being shown in E3, so do come across and have a chat and see some of that. Um, but I'm going to show you just some other things and talk through them as we go. Uh, so this is uh, a thing called the Moment of Madness. Um, it's a crazy uh, real-world game experience um, set in a car park. The players are on a live stakeout. Um, it's a mixture of technology and story and art and all of these things rolled into one. Um, and what's, I guess, interesting about this piece is that in order to make it, um, we're trying to get funding in the UK from a body called Arts Council England which may mean nothing in this room at all. Uh, but they take uh, the money from the government, maybe from the lottery. Um, so people that play the lottery, their money goes into a pot and it gets redistributed to people, makers like us, sometimes or artists like us. I'm not sure if the other makers get any funding this way, but it, in, within my peer group, it's very common um, to get money from places like the Heritage Lottery Fund and Arts Council England. Um, and as part of that, it's about reaching out to people and engaging people um, and obviously one of the ways we do that is to run maker-type events. So um, in the process of building this, which involves lots of technology and lots of storytelling, we will run a series of making-type events to get members of the public coming to make things, um, which I think is fantastic. And I mean, the negative side to that, I think probably, and perhaps the others will disagree with me again on this, um, is that the money that's spent from the Arts Council that goes to people like me um, probably doesn't do a good enough job of reaching the wide population. It's quite narrow in the people that we manage to attract. 
So um, in the UK, we would call that middle class. Um, so while, while the money is being given by everyone who plays the lottery, um, actually the money is probably not being spent in necessarily the right way. Um, I'm going to give the microphone over in a minute so people can kind of challenge me on that, which is fine. Um, put all my other examples on here. Um, and it, I mean, these are the, the other things that I do is that I make things for museums. Um, and a lot, a lot of the interactives you've seen in the science gallery, the types of things I make as well. So, um, so uh, big screen experiences, touch table experiences, camera type stuff. Um, and again, a lot, when, I, when I do this work for museums, we also um, do a lot of outreach in museums, we do a lot of um, workshops in museums, so things like the Babylon Beasts is something that will be run in, in museums. This is going to be run um, in November in the UK um, as part of a festival called Being Human. And again, I think, um, particularly where I'm based, which is Birmingham um, in England, um, again, museums attract quite a small demographic of the population, it's not a wider thing. Um, I, I think the thing that I was going back to again and again was really this, this amazing thing that these young people were doing earlier on, um, and how do we get out to the wider population? So I don't know if we're doing a good enough job of that in schools, really. Um, and so what, what I, one, one of the things we're seeing in the UK, again, is that there's a lot of money now being invested in making. Making is a big thing. You know, if, you, if you want to get money from Arts Council or someone, you put making in your project somewhere because you know you're going to get funded. Um, and just down the road from me, where I started making uh, the game Renga, um, I was based in a, a, an old museum that had been mothballed, that had been closed down, um, which was the silk mills that claims to be the world's first factory. And it's now going to be um, relaunched as the Museum of Making. So they've got in excess of £20 million to kind of become this kind of maker space and try and reach this more diverse population. Whether they succeed in doing that, I gen genuinely hope they do, but that's a, that's a big challenge to do that. But I think the fact that the government is giving money to those kind of spaces is probably saying they're not particularly happy with how schools are dealing with it. Or maybe they just don't have enough money to go around. Maybe that's the problem. Um, so, so I'm also speaking um, from the point of view of an educator. So obviously there's me educating in kind of the informal workshops and the outreach of museums and arts world. But I've spent um, 10 years in higher education as well. Um, I created and launched uh, a degree programme which I ran for for eight years, um, so my, my background is computer science, so this was, a, this was about can we take computer science um, and can we teach it in a more fun way, um, and so the, lots of the issues that Carol has raised um, are kind of related to that, um, particularly in terms of all these, all these great skills that we talk about from making, about problem solving, um, and just they, they don't always gel well with the academic structure and also what kids have learned on their way up. Um, again, this would be being critical of, and knowing that the, you know, these 18 year old um, young people that would come on the course, um, during their school life they've been very much taught how to pass tests. And so they're very much ingrained in this, what do we need to know to pass the test? And they really love this, I'm sure people can relate to this, they really love the idea of tell me what I need to do, I will do what I'm told to do, and if I do what I'm told to do then I expect to get an A grade, I expect to get a first class grade. And so it's really hard to then try and foster a kind of make a community over the top of that where we want to encourage people to tinker and to fail fast and to make mistakes. That's, I think that's quite a hard thing to do when everyone's like, what do I need to do to get my first class degree? Um, and I can wax lyrical about the problems of UK academia for quite a lot longer. So I'll, I'll skip over that because we might, get, we might get into it a bit more. We'll see. Um, and so um, through this uh, through some of this work I've built large scale um, projects um, and again we talked about this briefly earlier on this is a project for Hampton Court Palace um, a large scale game uh, real world experience where this sheep is your game controller and it talks to the players and talks to the other sheep and this is a very expensive um, high end experience a six figure budget um, to build this and so really I want to share that knowledge so not just about sharing knowledge with you know, with young people, but I want to share that knowledge with other museums who can't afford to, to do this. Um, and obviously, in those kind of spaces, um, maker and um, maker spaces are just unknown words. Um, as soon as you start talking about Arduinos or Raspberry Pis, people are terrified. Particularly as um, as the people that are working in the museums are not digital natives; they're generally older than me. A lot of the volunteers are a lot older, and so it was really about can we can we build things that encourages kind of making this playful experience that people can get their hands on very quickly but aren't 
that, that, that don't require this kind of background knowledge. And so that's where really um, things like Batman Beast came from. Um, and so that's kind of led me to kind of produce a number of online tutorials, which are, which are all down in this kind of maker space world of kind of encouraging people to build things very, very quickly. Um, these are all based on um, larger things that I built for museums that are well funded. And then how do we build a very simple, small version of those as quickly as possible to encourage people get, to get into this space? And once they're in there, they can start tinkering and start playing. Um, I'm going to stop there because I know we're supposed to be on uh, five minutes. So off. So my name is Nicola Sharman, I'm one half of Genetic Moo, we're also in the same space and we are interactive artists um, but we also run lots of workshops where we teach creative coding. Um, this particular piece I'll tell you about in a minute but it's a collaborative work and it was made with um, 12 mentors who are sixth formers and 120 primary schools all responsible for one shape. This is a video that shows uh, the output that's been joined together. So, um, as I say, I'm an artist, uh, first and foremost, but I've also been a teacher. I worked in sixth form education, and I taught um, media studies, filmmaking, editing in particular. Um, Tim and I are very excited by the potential of digital technology and coding in creating art. And it's one of the things that we love to share with young people. And because we love to do it, it means that we also want to open our art spaces up to them. So we see them as, as I said before, collaborative spaces. Um, we will uh, set up computers for them, or maybe bring in people who've got robotic skills, and invite youngsters in, but also adults as well, to come and make and to contribute to the space. So the piece we've got in E3 is called Micro World Singapore. It's a very small version of the sort of micro worlds we set up. It's where the artworks are talking to each other, as well as the audience, and participants can come in and create something. Um, so, uh, we, we do actually also get funding, but we get it, rather than it coming directly from the Arts Council, we tend to get funded by councils who are interested in us taking on some of the responsibilities that they would have liked the schools to take up, teaching coding, and delivering workshops. So, um, for example, we ran courses in Scunthorpe, um, for local secondary schools, we're invited in to teach creative coding uh, around the theme, uh, because it was the celebration of Shakespeare's birth, um, around the theme of Midsummer Night's Dream. So it's sort of magic and language, therefore, of course, coding. Um, so important to us, being my background's in teaching, so I do understand some of the administrative difficulties of actually trying to deliver what you want to deliver and what you have to do to you know, meet the expectations of the school, etc. Um, but so for us, um, Tim and I are interested in encouraging the next generation of digital artists. So we want to share our enthusiasm for it and the possibility of becoming an artist instantly in the space. But also, very importantly, we want to encourage independent learning because, of course, the child, the youngster or the adult may well go away and say, okay, well, I can take this further. So we want to nurture people having confidence to go away and do it. And because we want them to be independent learners, it's very important that we teach them open source software. So we teach them coding and processing. And if we're doing some sort of sprite animation, then we'll use something like Piscal so that they can go away and they can download it for free and they can get on with it. And how many of you are familiar with processing? So a few of you. Well, for those of you who aren't, it's marvellous because first of all, the children are writing code rather than dragging and dropping it. So they're really getting to the, the roots of what they need to know for coding. But also, because it's open source, there are enormous sample, uh, uh, libraries of samples of work which they can download and play with and get to grips with it. So we encourage that. We, of course, encourage problem solving. We want them to. You know, you do learn by making mistakes with programming, so that's important. Um, and what else did I want to say? 
Um, oh, in collaboration. Tim and I collaborate as artists, and we open up the space to other artists and tinkerers, makers, to contribute to the space. But we also invite uh, the visitors to be a part of that process as well. So into E3, you will also have a chance to become a squidlet, so to be digital art, or to make a drifter, um, or to actually do some cellular automata. But in that case, it's a, it's a graphic interface that you'll work with, and we'll tell you more behind the scenes. So thank you very much. This piece then was designed by, um, as I say, 12 uh, 17-year-olds acting as mentors. Um, we were taken on uh, for a STEAM project, um, we were the artists then contributing to that, and then these 12 mentors who were computer scientists had not worked um, with uh, coding for creative purposes, so that was new for them. Then each of them mentored um, over 12 children over two days in doing coding and they produced this. And Tim uh, created a physics engine and, and this is our perpetual motion machine. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, thank you. Um, I had hoped to have a sort of lively discussion. I suspect it's right at the end of the day. Everybody's really tired. I'm very happy to open out to questions, but um, I think that what would be really good is if you want to come along to E3. I mean, we've, we've brought together, we've been allowed together to bring this team together of artists, makers, creators. And what each one of them has done is brought work to put up in E3 that has this progression from, from kind of, if you like, low entry, inviting people to come into play, to being there to take them into a more complex world. And each of the works that people have brought have been to, designed to inspire learning, build confidence, and, and kind of really open the doors on this creative world. I think one of the things I'd just like to flag up that came out of this morning's discussion is you can tell these people firmly have their feet in the world of art. There was a lot of conversation this morning about STEM, and I think this sort of STEM, STEAM discussion and where that sits in maker spaces is also quite interesting that uh, Carol talked about silos and I think we want to be careful not to be creating new silos as we're challenging others. Um, I think there's some really, really big challenges here about education and, and it's come through this day and I think it's come through what these people have said. I'm not sure we've got time for a wider discussion but I'm very happy if people have got one or two questions to open it up but I quite understand if it's uh, time to go. Sorry, just want to check, do you really need that huge budget to like, get people to start? Uh, if I want to do a workshop, you need that huge budget, you know, like, like there is this bigger budget or something. Sorry, let me, let me just, Sorry, let me just <laughs> clarify. To the, to the six uh, figure budget for the sheep game, um, so that was a commercial piece of work that I did um, uh, that hasn't been funded yet, actually, that's, that's the proposed budget for it. But that's got nothing to do with the work that comes lower. Sorry if I've confu confused the matter there. Um, so, so, like this, for example, so this is the budget version of that same project. Um, and that's using a £50 phone. And the cards that we were using earlier on are 50 pence each. So, yeah, so generally the stuff that, that we do is probably on very low budgets. Um, that was for a, a much bigger team with developers and like professional voiceover artists and a lot of product designers because this is a that was a piece that's going to go into um, a palace a royal palace and it's going to sit there for many years so that's quite different from a lot of the work that we normally make um, and yeah arts council would not fund any of those kind of things so as that's a commercial project which doesn't you know address the maker world. Um, but people like me that are makers have to get paid somewhere down the line, so we take another work as well. Uh, thank you. I, I have to say it's really uh, quite amazing to hear the various things heard here. I've been now in the UK for 29 years. Uh, and, then, and people say, oh, what's the difference between teaching in the UK and, uh, and in Singapore? I don't know, I've never talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
sound, it sounds horrifying. <laughs> I'm sorry, but in, in Singapore, I wouldn't say money is dripping out the walls, but uh, education is yeah. absolutely a very high priority. Here. Yeah. But then again, uh, you get told to save a few cents here so they can have potted plants and things. Anyway, I may not say anything about it, but, okay. but uh, then, uh, I'll just say publicly, uh, I, I got out of uh, University of Surrey with a third class on us because I spent too much time making. So it is true what you say. You make or you get your good grades. Yeah. I'm sorry, it just seems to be that way. Uh, what I, um, I mean, what, what you shared just reminded me of uh, we at this point the speaker, right, the, the last speaker of uh, Sustainable Living Lab. Uh, he was an engineering student in NUS, mm -hmm. National University of Singapore, but he was very active in, in <coughs> other activities. And he realized that in the class, because in, in that era, all the students going to the engineering schools are all top grades, A, A students. And he decided that um, I certainly could not make it to the first class grade. Mm -hmm. And I could survive second class, I'm quite happy. Uh, then he used his creative mind. He said, I should make a way out for myself, to make myself known. So he decided to devote himself to do making engineering, social engineering. And, and true enough, after that, when he got first class, second class, or third class, he's all irrelevant. And he's now a founder of the Sustainable Living Lab. And he's, he's done great work. And this morning he was in our summit. And he, he, he made something that was so useful that it spun off into something that benefited uh, India. And it continued to run as a social enterprise. And it's now spreading out so many other uh, activities. And it's because he believed in making him believe in his innovation bit and to him great was not that great after all. It's, it's not something that is just after. <laughs> and, and we are changing the mindset also. I mean this morning I talk about how we managed to get into mainstream. Uh, we bring in a black learning program to school. And when I put that in I told the Ministry of Education no exams for this. Uh, we want the students to see purpose driven, black driven learning and interestingly they'll say I want to learn more because I need that knowledge to build up my competence. And uh, it's interesting that you talk about uh, the staff are not from the real world, right? And that's exactly what I told the Ministry of Education uh, when I was asked to bring a applied learning program, STEM applied learning program to schools. I actually told the Ministry, I also told the principals, I said, with due respect, you know, uh, but I, 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 I want to break the in cycle because the thing about it, most of the teachers have never left school. They went to university, they went to the teaching college, they came back to school, and they don't know what real world was. So I made it a point that uh, our curriculum specialists are all researchers, scientists who have really experienced the real world to come in and they devise and design curriculum to bring into the schools. And uh, we also purposely recruited people who have never gone through proper so called traditional formal pedagogy training so that they can be very wacky and creative. And this brought in to the school, and we kind of break the in cycle. And uh, it turned out to be quite a successful thing. Uh, when I was asked to do it, the task was to reach out to 50% of the 124 non-elite schools. The elite schools, they know what they, they are doing. The non-elite schools, we call them non-branded neighborhood schools. Morale was low, students went in with low esteem. Uh, but with this, uh, within three years, we exceeded that 62. We went to 70, 72, and, and uh, some of the schools wanted to come in, but they have been, the ministry have said, we need to put a stop to it. Why? Because they, they do not want to have all schools converting themselves into STEM, because in this real world, you need all kinds of people, not just engineers and scientists. And now I will talk about, uh, Kate, you, 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 you asked whether it should be STEM or STEAM. We debated over this. Should the A, to be, should the a be put in there? And the decision was, we assume A is part and parcel of our life. Right? Because you design thinking, art is, is, is so broad from philosophy to social sciences to the way you find art, music, and so on. So you put that art in there, it becomes like, what kind of art are you talking about now? So we, 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 we do it with this assumption that in aesthetic, we, we, look, we, we go after beautiful things, right? I mean, nice things, beautiful things. And we assume art is in there without speaking, without talking about it, whatever stem project that you do, you reach a point that you're making beautiful. From practical to become beautiful to design and so on and so forth. So 
We don't. We, we decided <laughs> to make it, make it that way, STEM. But we know that art will come in and we need the art part. And so much so that the Minister for Education also encouraged our people that you must always work with people who complement you. And, and in your team, make sure that you have artists coming in. Because they give you a very interesting perspective. So we are conscious. We are not narrowly saying that STEM, you put up a site. And that's the reason why in our biggest fair you see a very strong future. And next week you'll see even a stronger fusion of arts and science because next week is our third year running visual energy. It's really combining arts and science and technology. It's going to be so beautiful. <laughs> yes. <right>. <laughs> <laughs> So sorry, I guess I got I got a question. Yeah, because uh, I want to start a, a big I want to start a bigger workshop around my neighborhood because I stay around here. So uh, I just want to find out like if is it a more appropriate to like, start uh, a single session workshop or like a multiple workshop? And also the demographic like should I like just involve with the kids alone or like mixture of adults and Kids, yes, I, I just want to find some experience because yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. well, I'll answer. I do want because I, I, we're going to have to go quite quickly. But I will say, um, so I'm going to be around tomorrow. If you're around tomorrow, come and have a chat with us, okay? Um, but we, uh, the moment, uh, most of our workshops do tend to be standalone, single, you know, maybe one hour, um, just introducing them to processing. But literally, in the first two minutes, they are programming. They have something in front of them, okay? Um, but we do family ones as well, where we get a parent and a child working together. Usually the child takes the lead. Um, and we've done purely adult, we've done coding for artists. So it's really what you want to do and experimenting with it. But I can hear there are big differences maybe between Britain and Singapore in this attitude of art behind everything, because I don't think we can agree with that. It will happen at some point. So there was one more question over there, so perhaps, did you, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up on the point that you made, which is that people have gone on to be super successful without going for grades, but most kids don't have access or knowledge of that, and most parents don't, don't know that. So what can we do uh, as communities to really show kids that there are many you, roads You bring grow? something very sensitive to Singapore, because... <laughs> Our Minister for Education, the current one especially, is trying to abolish exams. But the parents are saying, no, 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 I need to know that my son, my daughter is cleverer than your son or your daughter. We need the A grades to prove that they are Asians. Okay, right. Anyway, uh, it will take generations to change the mindset. And this morning you heard about, uh, uh, I think Dale was sharing, sharing that uh, MIT is now allowing you to come in with portfolios. And we are seeing more of such. Many of our students are now getting what we call direct admission to schools. One of the boys, he went to MBS High School, right? And and, and MBS High School is an elite school. And schools like them have the autonomy. Uh, they can set aside 10%, 20% of students by direct entry. And you go there by what? You, you, you impress the panel, you show them your portfolio, and, and they, they can be admitted without having a grade. Uh, so, so we are changing and, and we are seeing more and more of such successful cases or examples to tell other parents, you learn the terms kiasu, kiasi, you know, I'm just uh, scared of being left behind, scared of being, you know, uh, whatever, right, okay. So, so it takes one or even two generations, still the current parents all know more and the younger parents <laughs> who went through without having to show their paper qualification. To, 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 to move on. And our government has made something very bold. As lately, they say that if you are good, you can climb the social ladder, career ladder, as high as possible. In the past, when you come in with a second class honors, your pay scale is this. First class, your pay scale is that, and you're stuck all the way till you retire. And we have broken that, even with a diploma. If you are very good, you can be paid as high as a PhD. So, so, I think we are changing. Singapore realized that paper chase is not the solution. But it takes time. Now our problem is the parents. <laughs> the parents. <laughs> who, <laughs> they say, no, I want exams. <laughs> That's a question. Now, um, hearing from, the, from the, the sharing here, that I want to um, understand, I mean, from your experience, 
For example, the maker space is meant to make uh, people, especially young maker, curious about things, inspire them, and then get them to become an independent learner that they wanted to actually try and do something. So, how do you actually get the maker space ready whenever there's a question, there's a, a, a so called problem, they go to the maker space, the problem can be solved or something that can be addressed to this young maker so that they can continue their interest and be inspired. Because makerspace can be very, so-called, in very wide spectrum, that you, you address many things. And all these so-called creation are something new, something different, something that someone may have not touched on. How do you actually get that <coughs> in, you know, in, I mean, in your experience in that makerspace itself? I think actually we had a really good example from these young people who, who sat down here earlier actually because what, what came out in leaps and bounds from them is the way that they, they inspired each other, they researched together, they worked as a community and, and I thought it was so interesting about the value of working in the maker space as opposed to the, to the, um, the school because they talked about different skill groups and, and I've seen it, I've seen it actually running workshops at Geek where parents have been quite concerned about their, their son or daughter who might be socially quite isolated and, and they come here and, and I get a lot of resistance because I work a lot with games and it's sort of like parents aren't sure that's a good use of time <laughs> and, and they bring their students and they say I'm really worried about my son or daughter because they spend a lot of time in their bedroom and they're really, they have no friends and all that kind of stuff and, and we had a wonderful example where mother came, she, she was sad that her son wanted to come and spend the day doing coding at half term but because of his social isolation and, and he came and we were doing a sort of Minecraft coding thing and, and when she came to collect him, so five hours later, he was surrounded by a large group of adoring fans, both male and female, because he had skills that the other students didn't have and they were working together on a project and he had a huge contribution to make and this woman actually cried. His mother cried and said, he's going to be all right. <laughs> and, and it was just, but she hadn't seen that in school because in school he was isolated and lonely. But in this new environment, he was respected and valued. And I think that that's what the Makerspace does. And I think I have an answer to how to set it up, but it's about the people. It's about creating the space that allow people to, to fulfill their interests or share their interests, but learn from others. Because nothing is more contagious than somebody else's interest or passion. That's where you want to be. And you don't always see that in classrooms, even though education's changing. <laughs>